What a wonderful God we serve. Listen, I'm going to tell you about today's message a little bit. Sometimes we have a message, sometimes God gives you a message, and you have a better understanding of what God wants to do and what God's going to say, and then you leave room for God to just move at that point. And then there's other days that you don't quite know what God's going to do, and so you just leave room for God to move all over. And that's one of those, today is one of those days. Because I'll tell you what I wanted to preach, what I thought I was going to preach, God said, not so. And so I'm going to just speak what God wants me to say. And I'm just going to open up and let God work. Is that okay? Is that okay? So while you're standing, if you have your Bibles, just open your Bibles. And we're going to read a number of verses from 2 Corinthians chapter 32. And then we'll jump to Genesis very quickly. 2 Corinthians chapter 32. 32, starting with verse 6, and we're going to jump to a couple different verses. He commanded, he as in King Hezekiah, appointed military officers over the people and assembled them before him in the square of the city gates and encouraged them with these words. Be strong, courageous, do not be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria and the vast army that is with him. For there is a greater power with us than with him. I could just stop there and preach there alone, but I'm going to keep reading. With him is only the arms of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us to fight our battle. And the people gained confidence from what Hezekiah, the king of Judah, said. And we're going to jump to verse number 10. It says, King Azera said, on what are you basing your confidence? This is him speaking to the people. That you remain in Jerusalem under siege. When Hezekiah says that the Lord our God will save us from the hands of the king of Azera, he is misleading you to let you die in hunger and thirst. Verse 13. Do, not, do you not know what I and my predecessors have done to all the people of the other lands? Were the gods of those nations ever able to deliver their land from my hand? Who of all the gods of these nations that my predecessors destroyed had been able to save his people from me? How then Can your God deliver you from my hand? Now, do not let Hezekiah deceive you and mislead you like this. Do not believe him. For no God of any nation or kingdom has been able to deliver his people from my hand or the hands of my predecessors. How much less will your God deliver you from my hand? He was very confident here. Then he went on, the king wrote a letter ridiculing the Lord, the God of Israel, and saying this against him. Just as the gods of the people of the other lands did not rescue their people from my hand, so the gods of Hezekiah will not rescue his people from my hands. Then they called out in Hebrew, Just in case the people couldn't understand him in the language he was speaking. Then he decided to call out in Hebrew to the people of Jerusalem who were on the wall to terrify them and to make them afraid in order to capture the city. They spoke about the gods of Jerusalem as they did about the gods of the other people of the world. The work of of human hands. King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, cried out in a prayer to heaven about this. And verse 21, and the Lord sent his angel who annihilated all the fighting men and the commanders and officers in the camp of the Caesarean king. So the king withdrew 
to his own land in disgrace. And when he went into the temple of his God, some of his sons, his own flesh and blood, cut him down with the sword. Let's quickly turn to Genesis 32, just two verses, verse 5 and verse 9. Joseph had a dream, and when he told his brothers, they hated him all the more. And verse 9, then he had another dream, and when he told his brothers, listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for your blessings and your goodness for just waking us up today and giving us an opportunity to come into your presence and worshiping you, God. We thank you, God. Not everyone has this opportunity, God, but we thank you that you have blessed us with this opportunity, God. I ask you, God, that you may speak today, God. Don't let my limitations prevent your word from coming through, God, from touching your people, God. Bless us right now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 And as you're seated, turn to someone and tell them the title of my message. It's called Rescued. Rescued. Turn to the other person and ask them, have you ever been rescued? <laughs> rescued. So I want to tell you of a story that I, some of you already know and some of you have heard some of it before. And it was a time that I, in grade three, in the third grade, we did an end of the year party at our teacher's house, Miss Robinson. Now this was years ago, it was, a, it was a crazy time, but it was not crazy like this. And so you're able to go to your teacher's home and you did a pool party at the end of the year. And she had a large pool and it backed out to a park. And so we had people that we would play in the pool and, then every, and some that would play out in the park and every 30 minutes or so she'd blow a whistle and you'd switch and you'd then play in the pool. Someone else would go to the park. That would not happen today, but it was something that happened back then. And I spent most of my time out in the field day, playing in the park. Why? Because I could not swim. And so I was not going near the water. And so I would do this, everything everyone else was doing, play kickball, you know, Red Rover, Red Rover, all of those games that you did back then before you were in the house on video games. And after doing that for an extended period of time, it was hot. And so I thought, let me go to this pool. Probably not my wisest decision. But then again, I was only in the third grade. And so I went to the pool and I decided I'm going to stay in the shallow end of the pool. And I remember jumping in and kicking water and splashing and all of the above and pretending I can swim because everyone else was swimming. And then more kids started piling in the pool. And it started to move me from the shallow end more towards the deep end. And I remember fighting those kids to get back into the shallow end. Why? Because I could not swim. And I remember uh, it kept pushing me further and further towards the deep end. And before I knew it, I was bumped and I slid down the slide into the deep end of the pool. I remember struggling and fighting to get out of that deep end of the pool. And I remember at one point, I hit the bottom of the pool and I knew enough to jump up and to push as hard as I can to get up to the top. And I got up to the top high enough to yell, help, help. I remember screaming that twice before I sunk back down. But the music was going, too many people were in the pool so they couldn't hear me. And I remember sinking down again and I remember getting down to the bottom and I thought I have enough strength to get up another time. And I remember jumping off of the bottom of the pool and pulling up as hard as I could and I went up to yell, help! And right then I started swallowing too much water and I started sinking. And I remember it feeling like a thousand years as I slowly drifted to the bottom of the pool. And I remembered before hitting the bottom, I blacked out. Well, spoiler alert, you know I made it. (laughs) 
However, the, the next thing I remembered when I came through, I was laying on the deck beside the pool and my teacher, Miss Robinson, was giving me mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Or as I remember it as a third grader, that was my first grown-up kiss. <laughs> Too much? Okay, I'll go on. And so I remember getting up and I remember coughing and water came shooting out of my mouth. And then I remember getting up and I went into the house, into the basement, and I fixed my afro. <laughs> you know, the important things. <laughs> and I'll never forget that day. And I remember hearing my father speak about it later, and it, but it really never hit me until a couple of years ago, just at the beginning of the pandemic when he was here visiting. And I remember him telling me about that day. And he said that he was driving to work that day and he had this overwhelming presence or sense to pray for his kids. And he started to pray earnestly for his kids. And that's not unusual for my dad because he's a prayer while he's a driver. You know? And maybe that's where it comes from because I'll, I'll be driving and I'll be praying. Praying for all the crazy people on traffic but also praying for family and everything. I'm just praying. And he said that he had this overwhelming presence to pray for his kids and he said he got to work and even while he was at work he said at this one moment in time while he was way up there in the scaffold and if you know my dad when you're at work he just works it's only work he doesn't fool around or talk about anything else it's all about work and he said he had this overwhelming spirit to pray for his children again and he stopped work and he started to pray and he started praying for me in particular and he said he had no idea why, but he just wanted to pray. Listen, when I thought that all hope was done, when I thought that I was dead, when I thought that it was done, when I thought I was sinking and nothing else could happen, and when I thought God didn't hear my plea, God heard my cry. God heard me. And God heard his cry. See, there's sometimes that God is calling on you to pray. And you don't have know why he's calling on you to pray. He doesn't know why exactly what's going on. It's not for you to know. It's for you to just get up and pray. It's for you to start speaking. It's for you to start intercessing. It's for you to just start calling out that person's name and saying, God, I don't know why, God, but you move. You move, Jesus, God. You speak into their situation. Speak into that home. Speak into their life right now. I don't know what was going on. I thought I was dead. I thought I was without hope. But God had another plan for me. God rescued me. God rescued me. God did. God said that I heard the cry of my people. And I was moved by their tears. And God rescued me. He did. He did. God rescued me. God did. God did. See, if God has never rescued you, you'd be timid to put up your hands. But when you know that God has rescued you, when you know that it's God that stepped in, that you had a hopeless case. You didn't know where to do, where to go, what to do. But in the middle of your distress and hopelessness, and when you didn't know what else to do or where else to turn, when it was everything was against you, God showed up, God stepped in. And if you know God rescued you, no one has to tell you to worship him. No one has to tell you to give him praise. I'm gonna praise God, why? Because God rescued me. I was lost and God rescued me. I was hopeless and God rescued me. Death was a certainty, but yet God came and he rescued me. If God rescued you, I don't have to tell you to worship. I don't have to tell you to praise. I don't have to encourage you to give. Why? Because you know it was the power of God. You know it wasn't your skills. It wasn't your abilities. You know it wasn't you. It was only the hands of God. God rescued me. God did that. God did that. God did. 
I can imagine interviewing Moses when Moses said to Moses, has God ever rescued you? And Moses said, you better believe God rescued me. I couldn't put two sentences together without stuttering. But God used this lips, this hand, to free his people, to free his people. He said, I heard the army coming behind me, and I saw the Red Sea in front of me, and only God could move, and God rescued me. God did that. I can ask the three Hebrew boys, has God ever rescued you? They said, did he? The king said to us, we had to bow. We, had, we knew death was a certainty. But we said, we know in whom we serve, and we are not going to bow down. Regardless of what you do to us, regardless of what happened, I will not bow down. And even when we're thrown in the fire, God came in and he covered over us. He covered over us, hedged of protection about us. God rescued me. God did that. God did that. If you're desperate enough, you know it's God. Listen, Gideon was sitting in a hole, in a hole hiding from his enemies. And the angel of God came to him and said, mighty man of valor. I can just imagine Gideon saying, he called me a mighty man of valor. Do you know what valor means? Valor means brave, courageous. Gideon would say, I was in a hole hiding. But God didn't call me based on where I was. God didn't call me based on where I am. God didn't call me based on my history or my past. God looked at me, God saw my future, God knew what he had in me, and God called me mighty man of valor. You are courageous. I'm going to do a work in you that you couldn't do by yourself. Why? Because God rescued me. God did that. God did that. Far too many times we think it's us. But I know it's God. God did that. God is still in the rescuing business. See, because I've been rescued myself, I know that God comes to rescue us in two different ways. God comes to rescue us sometimes from our circumstance. You know, it could be circumstances that were unpredictable and we never saw it coming. And it could sometimes be circumstances that the enemy opened a door and we walked right into it. But God can rescue us from circumstances. See, in this chapter that we read, in the scripture and the story that we read in 2 Chronicles, there was a starting to be a move of God over the children of Israel because for years they walked away from God. They wanted to be similar to the people around them. They didn't want to stand out like God wanted them to stand out and to be different. And they said, the other nations have a king, so we want a king also. And so they started to walk away from God and even started to worship idols that they made with their own hands. That's not what God has called us to do. But sometimes we want to be similar to those around us. But God was, there was a move of God in the area. And God was starting to change hearts and bring them back to him. A matter of fact, if you read the chapter before, and I'm encouraging you to go back and read 2 Chronicles 31, and that's where there was a move of God in that place. And people came out and they started worshiping God with their mouth. They started glorifying God and coming back to the things of God. A matter of fact, they started tearing down the idols in their home, and they went to their neighbors and started tearing down the idols in theirs. They started selling stuff in their home and giving to God because they know that if they worship God with their voices, if they worship God with their deeds, and if they worship God with their offerings, then they know that that is a move. That's starting out of a move of God. Sometimes it takes you to do something ridiculous before your blessing so you can start to see how God can start to move in that blessing. And the king of Azera heard 
Hezekiah speaking to the people. And all of a sudden, he decided he was going to raise his head. Really, he had no issues with the children of Israel. But he wanted to dominate them so that they would pay taxes and tariff to his kingdom forever. And this is what the king of Assyria started to do. He came and he started to speak directly to the people. He, what he said was quite precise, was intentional, and for the most part, he was actually quite historically proven what he was saying. He was precise because he said in 2 Corinthians 32, he says, do you, he asked a single question. He didn't waste any words. He says, do you not know what I and my predecessors have done to all the people of the other land. And just by asking that question alone, fear started to develop in the heart of God people. He was quite intentional that what he said was exactly for the purpose of driving home fear. And so in verse 14 he says, who of all of the gods of these nations that my predecessors destroyed has ever been able to save his people from me? And then he started to, and then he continued to go on. He said in verse 17, just as the gods of the people of the other lands did not rescue the people from, rescue the people from my hands. And up to that point, he was very historically correct. No other nation had been successful, successfully able to defend him off. They were the most dominant um, country at that point and taken over many countries. But then he started to lose his mind. And he started to talk, be too boastful and too prideful. And he forgot about the God that he was speaking to at that point. And then he went on to say, so the gods of Hezekiah will not rescue his people from my hands. Lies. Lies. See, the enemy tricks, the enemy's tricks are the exact same tricks, the exact same tactics that he's used generation to, after generation after generation. It's just packaged for a new generation. The enemies will use your fears and will use your insecurities and your vulnerability to tell you all sorts of lies. And all he's simply doing, he's telling the exact same lies that he told your grandparents, he told your parents, and now he's telling you. And he's now telling you that that's gonna happen with your children also. He's telling the exact same lie. Listen, he's the father of all lies, and you have to look him straight in the eye, and you have to tell him exactly what he's doing. You have to say lies. I know you're telling me that I'm fearful in this situation. I know you're telling me that they may not make it, but lies. You are the father of all lies. And what he doesn't know is that when he lies to you, and he lies generation after generation after generation, what he doesn't know is that I serve the same God generation after generation after generation. So the same God that saved me, the same God that rescued me, the same God that kept me in the last generation and before that is the exact same God that will save me right now. The same God that, in, that the children of Israel serve is the exact same God of today. Jesus name. Let's just pause right now and let's just pray. Heavenly Father, God, right now, Lord, you know, Heavenly Father, God, all situations, God, and you are the great healer, God. Right now, Heavenly Father, God, place your hands upon her, God. Heal her body physically, God, and spiritually, God. We know that you can. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone says, amen, amen, amen. What you have to realize is that you continue to serve the exact same God. The exact same God who rescued people in the past. The exact same God who rescued the Hebrew boys in the past. It's the exact same God that will rescue me today. The exact same God that delivered Ruth in her situation. Let me tell you, Ruth thought that she was in a hopeless situation. Her husband just died. Her father-in-law just died. Her mother-in-law was telling her to go back home. I have nothing more for you. But she knew that she served a God that could do all things. It wasn't her God initially. It was her mother-in-law's God. It wasn't even her God. She didn't initially serve it. It was her husband's God. But when she saw how God moved in her situation, she knew, she said to her mother-in-law, I'm not going to leave you. Where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Where you die, I'm going to die. Why? Because where whoever your God is will be my God. 
And let me tell you, Jesus rescued her in her situation, even in her relationship. And you say, how does a relationship deem as a rescue? Let me tell you. God opened up a way for her in ways that we would never have imagined. We could never have thought of. She met her husband, which was Boaz. And you're thinking, well, that's just a relationship. But let me tell you, when God's in the middle of that relationship, it's not just a relationship. When God's in the middle of that marriage, it's not just a marriage. When God's in the middle of that conversation, it's not just a conversation. I just need God to be in the middle of my situation, and God can change all things. Listen, when God introduced her to Boaz, and they got married, her whole life changed. And not just her life, but generations changed. Because of Boaz, they had a child named Obed. And Obed grew up, and he had a child named Jesse. And Jesse grew up, and he had a child named David. Yes, that same David, King David, David and Goliath, David that Jesus said is God. He's a man after my own heart. Listen, when God rescued you, God will change generations simply because of the rescue that he had in your life. You think that God has rescued you and because of you. You think God's rescued you and because of your situation. God's rescued you for your total, for two and three and four more generations. God rescued me. God did that. God did that. God rescued me. See, when Hezekiah was sick and tired of hearing the enemy lie and hearing the enemy tell him that what God can't do and what God's not going to do and how God's going to destroy him, then Hezekiah lifted up his voice and Hezekiah started praying. When you're sick and tired of your situation and when you're sick and tired of being sick and tired and you know what, you don't know what else to do, that's when you turn your voice to God. God, I don't know what else to say. I don't know what else to do. I've been manipulating it all this time. I've been trying to get this to work and I can't do it no longer. But God, I now turn it to you and I'm gonna take my hands off of it and you move, Heavenly Father. When Hezekiah started praying, it said that the spirit of the God came down and he annihilated the word of God said, completely destroyed the enemy. God can do that exact same thing in your life, in your situation, in your circumstances. God can deliver you from your circumstance. God can do that. God can do that. What's your Hezekiah story? What's your resurrection story? What's your rescue story? Don't keep that hidden. God has done that. God can do that. See, because I've been rescued, I know that God can still rescue. And I know that God rescued you in two different ways. If you can turn this monitor up just a little bit more. I know that he rescued you from situations and circumstances. But I know sometime God needs to rescue us from ourselves. God knows that trouble comes via the enemy. And God can rescue you from that. And then he knows that trouble comes from circumstance and situations that sometimes is out of your control. And God can rescue you from that also. But other times the problem is you. It's you. And if you let God, he can rescue you from you also. Sometimes God is telling us that you talk too much. You're too prideful. You elevated yourself too much. You're too self-reliant. You think it's all about you. And in my case, maybe you think too much. Listen, God can rescue you from even you. See, Joseph found himself in that situation. Joseph, when he was still young and immature, he took the blessings that God had for him, and he started to use it to elevate himself. 
He started, instead of blessing others, he started to become so boastful and started speaking about himself. And it's not because he was a bad person. It was simply because he was young and immature in the things of God and what God had for him. He was inexperienced. And so it wasn't the enemy that got him thrown into the pit. It wasn't an unforeseen situation that got him thrown into the pit. It was his own mouth that got him thrown into the pit. And sometimes what gets us in the trouble that we're in is our own mouth, our own actions, our own lack of doing something or of doing far too much. Instead of letting God move, we're trying to move. And letting God speak, we're trying to speak. Well, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. No, keep your mind. And let God move. And so it's easy sometimes for us to say, okay, Joseph, just calm down. Your mouth got you in that trouble. And it's okay, it's okay. God's going to get you out. It's so easy for us to say, but we have the luxury of reading the story and knowing the end. Joseph was actually living it at that point in time. You know, Joseph was the one that was sitting in the pit for an entire day wondering what his brothers were going to do to him at the age of 17. Joseph lived in Potiphar's house as a servant, as a slave for 11 years until he was age 28. Joseph then thought that things were finally getting a little bit better and he thought things were finally on the up and God was finally going to work out. And then after, then he ended up getting thrown in prison and spent two years in prison until age 30. And then even after he got out of prison, after being falsely accused and got out of prison, it was another eight to ten years until he was 40 years old before he saw his family again and he saw the work of God, the word that God gave him so many years before. Listen, he could have easily got frustrated. He could have easily got upset. He could have said, God, I, I, this can't happen anymore. I'm too old. I'm beyond my prime. This isn't going to happen for me anymore. The word that you gave me, the blessing you told me about, is not going to happen anymore. He could have easily gotten frustrated and gave up. It's easy for us to do. God, I've been struggling with this now for over six months. God, you told me this a year ago, and I still don't see it come through yet. God, where are you? It's easy for us to give up and to, for us to throw in the towel. And so when you're going through a situation that seems like it's taken forever, and what God told you doesn't seem like it's going through, I know it can be extremely hard to continue to hold the faith. And before I tell you what God can do, let me be honest and let you know that. Even though you may be struggling with for a long time now, you may only be in your pit right now. And you still have to spend another day or so in your situation. If I'm being very honest. If I'm being very honest, you may be 11 years into your situation. And you're saying, God, is this still going to even happen for me? And now it finally starts to start looking better. And then you get into a turmoil, a situation. You're imprisoned in your own sort of circumstance. And you think, God has forgotten all about me. But let me tell you, God has not forgotten you. God has not turned his back on you. God has not left you alone. God did not place that in you just to leave you alone. God is right there, right there right there. Listen, the word of God says that weeping may endure for a night and it may look dark and it may look bad and it may look like there's no way out and it may be storming and out of control but the word of God says that joy comes in the morning. What he's also saying is that deliverance will come six months in. Deliverance can come 11 year in. Deliverance can come 30 years later. Rescue can come years after. He said, just hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on to God's unchanging hand. Everything else will change. People will change. Life will change. Situations will change. But I'm going to hold the hands of the one that never changed. The same God. Same God. Same God. I'm going to hold on to that hand. 
in the middle of your situation, just hold on. Hold on. If God has told you that, believe me, it will come to pass. If God has given you a word, hold on to that word. See, it's easy for us to ask for a new word and a fresh word and a jump in my spirit kind of a word. But let me tell you, if God has given you a word, hold on to that word. That word could have came to you in 1975. That word is not too old yet. That word could have came to you in 1983. It's not out of fashion. It's not out of style. Hold on to the word that God gave you. That word could have came in, two, in 2000 when Y2K and your anxiety ravished for the first time. God will come through. God is not a God of yesterday. God is not just a God of right now. God will come through and rescue you right in the middle of your situation. Hold on to that word. Hold on to the word that God says. Hold on. See, you didn't even realize that the exact same word that came from our master was the exact same word that God is going to work in your life. He already spoke that word into existence long before you were even around. Your rescue was already planned long before you were around. He spoke this world into existence, the master's word. He spoke and separated light from darkness. He breathed life into us. What makes you think that the word that he gave you back then is void now? That word is still just as good then as it is right now. Hold on to his word. Hold on. I don't need a new word. I just need to brush off the one that he gave me years ago. And I'm going to hold it. I'm going to hold on to what God said. See, I can believe what the devil tells me. Or I can hold on to what God said is going to happen. I can hold on to the hands of God. Listen, the enemy lies to us all the time. And if I don't know what God has said in my life that he's going to do through me, I can start to believe what the devil tells me. But you know what? I'm going to hold on to the word that he gave me years ago. So when he steps in and he starts telling me a lie, when he says to me that you're never going to have kids, I'm going to say lie. And that comes from the pit of, when he said to me, Brian, you will never have kids. That's a lie. When he said to me that when you finally do have kids, that the school and that society is going to destroy them, lies. When he said to me that my sins and my iniquities are going to then leave sin on them, I know it's a lie. Why? Because if God rescued me, God can rescue them. If God rescued me, God can rescue you. If God rescued you, he can rescue your children. Don't give up on them because they're not born the right way. Turn them over to God. God wasn't though. You didn't save yourself. God saved you. You didn't rescue yourself. God rescued you. So why do you think you have to rescue them? Turn it over to God. He's the one who can rescue you. He's the one who's going to rescue them. He'll do it. He'll do it. He will do it. Before I start wrapping up, let me tell you two truths. Because I don't want it to just sink into your spirit. I also want it to sink into your mind. And for you to clearly know, rarely will you ever see or feel the rescue coming until it's actually right upon you. You're going to feel like you're drowning. You're going to feel like you're lost. You're going to feel like you're broken. You're going to feel like you've already lost. And then your rescue is going to arrive. You're going to get the promotion. And then you're going to realize that the working environment is still horrible. You're standing on a word for a child and you just suffered your third miscarriage. You're trusting God to restore your relationship, and you just got filed with divorce papers. 
You're believing God that your child will come around, but he won't even return your call. You're praying for a healing, and then you get the phone call that she died. You're going to feel like you're drowning. You're losing. You're broken. Like you've already lost just before the rescue happens. Your rescue will often look very different than you expect. You expected her to live. But God's still in control. God has a reason for your rescue. God has a purpose for your rescue. God has a purpose for you. That's why he rescued you. And most importantly, God's plan started much earlier than your actual rescue. You thought that God just showed up that moment, but God was orchestrating this and planning this for years before. So what you assume as the plan, or it has to go this way, may be the exact opposite way of your rescue. But let me tell you, either way, God will rescue you. And you have to trust God. You have to trust God that how he rescue you is the right way. It's not always going to feel right and not always going to feel great. He's going to feel like he's late. He often feels like he's late. I didn't think that I was going to black out before he saved me. But he saved you nonetheless. One Christian writer said it this way. Sometimes the accumulation of all of our efforts and the answer to our prayer is that God restores us in our relationship. And sometimes he rescues us out of that same relationship. Your rescue will often look very different than you expect. As I'm closing, I want to tell you about the way that I see Judgment Day come in, and I've seen it this way my entire life. And I have, as I have to think about it, I don't know, I didn't know why I thought about it this way. I didn't read it anywhere. I've never even seen it in the Bible. I don't know if I saw it on TV. I just don't know where it came from until I started preparing for this word. And I can envision Judgment Day being that I'm standing with Jesus and I'm standing in front of the pearly gates and there's a long train of individuals waiting for their turn. And that there's this huge screen, like a massive IMAX screen, a texas size IMAX screen. And every phase of my life is being shown on this screen. I don't know where I got that from. Like, it, I didn't read that in the Bible. And I can just imagine standing there beside my Savior, and I see my life flash before me. And I can see periods in which I did exactly what God told me to do, and I felt, and I feel proud that I followed the call of God in that situation. And I can see other scenes in my life in which I did completely opposite of what God told me to. And I can feel embarrassed. And I feel shame. And I can't even, I can't, there's not even any excuses that I can say at that point. And I can see other times in my life that God is speaking to me and God called, and I see some certain things that happen and I'm like, oh, that's why you did that. Because I can now see how God was moving because I see it on this massive screen. 
And then at the end of it, at the end of it all, I could see my Savior saying, come in. Come in. Well done, my good and faithful servant. For years, I've had that vision of that's what Judgment Day is going to look like for me. And I had no idea where that came from. But while I was studying this week, it just came to me of where that actually came from. When I was in the pool, and when I got hit and slid down the, into the deep end, I remember being in a great panic. And I remember fighting the water as much as I could. And I remember when I finally hit the bottom, I consciously thought in my mind, I have to jump up as high as I can to get to the top to cry out for help. And I remember hitting the bottom and pulling as hard as I could up. And I yelled out, help, help. but there was too much music and kids were playing and they couldn't hear me. And I remember sinking back down again and I continued to fight. And I remember when I hit the bottom again, I said, I have to get back up and I pulled as hard as I could and I got up and I yelled, help. But I started swallowing water and I started to panic. And I remember starting to sink. I remember starting to suffocate. And my lungs were burning. And I remember it feeling like an elephant was sitting on my chest. And I remember struggling. And it felt like forever as I drifted down near the bottom of the pool. And I remember as I was drifting down, I saw clips of my life flash before me. I saw days of myself outside playing with my siblings. I saw days of me at church. I saw days of me at school. I clearly remember seeing days of us sitting around my parents' bed, kneeling around our bed as we did Bible study. And my last thought was, right at that moment, I remember thinking, I won't even make it to my baseball game later today. (laughs) And when I finally lost consciousness and stopped fighting, God in his infinite mercies and in his grace And in his wisdom, knew that he had to step in at that same time. And he bent down, and he scooped me up, and he raised me to a level that I could not do on my own. God rescued me. Then it clearly came to me that I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within. I was sinking to rise no more. But but the master of the sea. He heard my despairing cry. And from the waters, he lifted me. He rescued me. He lifted me. Now safe and secure am I. It was God 
that lifted me. As we all stand, God lifted me. When nothing else could have saved me or could have helped, it was the love and the mercies of God that rescued me. As you bow your head and close your eyes, I was physically rescued. But let me tell you, I've been spiritually rescued so many times. I didn't deserve it. I couldn't have expected it. But God stepped in and rescued me out of my sinful, desperate stage. If you know that God has rescued you, you start to raise your hands. You throw up a prayer. You say, God, I know you're the one that did it in my life. I didn't deserve it. I did not deserve it. I deserved anything but your rescue, anything but your mercy. But you stepped in and you rescued me. You did it, God. I will be eternally grateful, God, because you saved me. You did. My life's desire is to hear you say, come in, thy good and faithful servant. Thank you.